Hi everyone, so my name is Christine and this class is titled Hope and Beauty, the Power of Classical Culture in Shaping the Future. I think it's safe to say that many here in the West remain uncertain as to what the new Silk Road is supposed to represent or maybe outright cynical about the whole thing. The truth of the matter is that we are situated in a moment of history where we are at the brink of entering a new paradigm, a paradigm in which we no longer base our interactions with other countries on the basis of zero-sum growth policies, that is, uh, the belief that there are limited resources, and therefore for one country to benefit, another must suffer a loss, but rather that it is possible to have a win-win cooperation where both sides can benefit from the other's gain. I want us to take a moment and be honest with ourselves and think what comes to our minds first when we think of Africa today. Is it not, not you know, fair to say that many of these images are what first come to our minds? And isn't it not the dominating impression of Africa today that it is a hopeless, ongoing condition of war, famine, disease, poverty? Many have come to the conclusion at this point that there's not much we can do for Africa. The best we can do is offer aid, but to change its direction entirely seems an impossibility. Our conference today is to address that dominating impression. True, there are many problems prevalent in Africa today, but it is not the true identity of Africa. This level of war and despair was never supposed to be. And if we can come to understand why this is true, we are then free to see the real future of Africa. It's real potential, which will not only come to uplift hundreds of millions of African lives, but will come to uplift the world. Therefore, to answer the above question, what is the real destiny of Africa? We have to first look at what Africa was in its past. It would be difficult to find someone who's not aware of the impressive civilization of ancient Egypt. But how many of the other great civilizations in Africa are most people aware of? Also, we should ask ourselves, why was ancient Egypt so impressive? Was it because they had a massive army? Was it because they had the largest territory? Was it because they had the greatest physical dominance over the world? In fact, they had none of those. It is rather that they had produced some of the greatest works in science, architecture, and art. Ancient Egypt existed for over 3,000 years as one of the most advanced science centers of the world during its time. Therefore, how do we measure which civilizations were great in the past, which we can then use as the standard to judge the present and the future? The things that tend to stand out the most to us are how big were these cities able to become? That is, how many people were they able to sustain? What scientific discoveries occurred that increased the standard of living of its people? And is it not fair to say what were its accomplishments in art? Why do you think this is the case? What causes us to be moved by art? What role does art have to play in measuring the greatness of a civilization? Let us move on to a lesser known example, the Yoruba Kingdom. It is known as far back as the 8th century that a powerful Yoruba kingdom existed. It is now uh, the area of Nigeria and Benin. The Yoruba have been known since the beginning of their existence as the most urbanized people in Africa. They still exist as a people today. For centuries before the arrival of British colonialism, most Yoruba already lived in well-structured urban centers organized around powerful city-states. In ancient times, most of these cities were fortresses with high walls and gates. Yoruba cities have uh, always been the most populous in Africa, and archaeological findings indicate that Kutunga, the capital of the Yoruba Empire of Oyo at the time between the 12th and 18th century, uh, their peak was between the 15th and 18th century, had a population of over 100,000 people, the largest single population of any African settlement at that time in history. Today, Lagos in Nigeria, another major Yoruba city, has a population of over 18 million and remains the largest city of the African continent. 
Not much remains of what the ancient cities looked like of the Yoruban people, but what has remained are their works of art. In the period around 1300 AD, a sculptural tradition was developed in terracotta, stone, and copper alloy. It is undeniable that to be able to create such detail not only requires a skill in advanced tool making and a great skill in sculpting, but an ability to uh, encapsulate the spirit of nobility and dignity, meaning the artists themselves must have an understanding of the nature of such things. For in order to portray, one must first be sensitive to it. That such works of art is associated with the most populous region of Africa since the common era should cause us to readjust how we look at the sub-Saharan Africa. Yoruban cities were not only the most populated, but from where all evidence points were very advanced in their city planning and were flourishing in the sciences and arts. Another example is the Kingdom of Kush. Many critics would say that what the Kush people developed in their arts and sciences were wholly due to the influence of the Egyptians. I would disagree with this oversimplification. Not much is known about the Kush people until the military campaigns by Egypt in 21st century BC started. However, I think it's safe to say that the Kush people's resistance was so powerful that the next military campaigns conducted were only uh, by the Egyptians were only by the 16th century. That means over 500 years they didn't really attempt <laughs> a campaign against the Kush people. Um, by then, Egypt had annexed Kush, which is known as Nubia. And uh, despite that, the Kush people rebelled for another 220 years, which I can't <coughs> help but be reminded a little bit of the Irish in uh, their, their passion. During the New Kingdom era of Egypt, Nubia, despite holding tight to their own identity against the Egyptian occupation, became a key province economically, politically, and spiritually. And by 744 BC, Egypt had become so weak that the Kush people rebelled and were successful in taking it over. They formed the 25th dynasty of Egypt. And I would say that Egypt was on the decline, and when the Kush people took over, it went into an upwards trajectory. This can be seen in the fact that in the Nile Valley was the first widespread construction of pyramids, now known as the Sudan area, since the Middle Kingdom. The Kush people continued to exist uh, until the fourth century AD, but they lost Egypt to the As Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians tried to start a 26th dynasty, but failed completely. There are other African civilizations to note, which we don't have time to go over, most notably ancient Carthage, the land of Punt, Empire of Mali, the Empire of Songhai, and others. Do these cultures and civilizations seem like something that was leading towards what Africa has become today? Which depiction is the true Africa? That is the Africa that should be, that should have become. To get us thinking on how to respond to that question, let us look into a present-day African example of something completely different from what most people think they know, the Kinshasa Orchestra. I'll play you a short uh, video. Malheureusement, je ne suis pas l'unité des formations. C'est la deuxième pointe qui va sourire. Et puis, euh, ça, ça peut être le cinquième. Tir. Pour le moment, je suis en train d'envisager euh, quelques instruments pour l'orchestre de l'Union des Médias.
1993, après que j'ai fini ma formation de pilote d'avion, j'étais ici à Kinshasa. C'était une période où j'étais au chômage, malheureusement. C'est ce qui m'a permis à rassembler tous ces mondes et créer l'orchestre symphonique humaniste. Quand je chante, je peux dire que ça m'aide à, à réfléchir ou soit j'ai un problème. Dès que je suis en train de, de chanter, j'oublie tout. Des fois, quand je suis malade et que j'écoute la chanson, ça la force. Donc, la musique, ça me donne la force. Sans la musique, moi, je ne peux pas vivre parce que c'est ma passion. Sans la coiffure, je ne peux pas vivre parce qu'à présent, c'est ça qui paye. Si la coiffure ne paye pas, je ne t'y dis pas. Si la coiffure ne paye pas, je ne saurais pas me déplacer pour aller à la répétition. Donc là, je crève. I find that to be uh, truly inspiring and remember they had to build everything from scratch including their instruments. Uh, classical music has been wrongly classified as white man's music or white European male's music. This could not be further from the truth. Classical music is classical because it is a universal art form. In other words, it does not belong to one group of people, culture, country, or time period. Rather, it transcends time. It is thus universal because it can at once speak to the soul of an individual, no matter where they come from, no matter what language they speak, and no matter what their experience has been thus far. Classical music, therefore, does not belong to just white Europe. It belongs to the world. I'll go through another example later on to showcase further why this is the case. So which identity will ultimately shape the fate of Africa? What is further needed for this vision to succeed? Well, let us not be naive that Africa has been reduced to extreme poverty due largely to the in interference of colonialism. Not just the colonialism of the late 19th and early 20th century, which is largely acknowledged today, but the continual colonization of Africa through policies of the IMF and World Bank. After over 175 years of ongoing imperial rule, even if these policies were to be lifted tomorrow, it would take Africa a very long time to catch up, having been prevented from forming a functional infrastructure base. This is where the importance of the new Silk Road comes in. Before I go further in explaining what the cultural implications are to the new Silk Road, I think it's necessary to discuss first what was the ancient Silk Road. The ancient Silk Road, for those who are not aware, 
was extremely important since it was the first time ever that the European, Asian, and Northeastern African worlds were connected. Although there were trade routes that pre-exist this, most notably under the Persian Empire, it was really only when China became open to trade that it earned its name and its significance. Before the ancient Silk Roads, China was primarily an introverted economy and produced almost everything for itself. It was closed off to trade with foreign countries. The Chinese Empire had a great distrust of anything foreign to its culture and way of life. However, during the rule of the Han Dynasty under Emperor Wu, 156 to 87 BC was when he lived. Trade became officially open between the East and West in 130 BC. It continued until 1453 AD when it was closed off by the Ottoman Empire. People would travel with camels across these routes and engage in trade, entering regions they had never seen before, interacting with people they knew nothing of beforehand. It was a very rich period of exchanging knowledge and an openness to learn from other cultures. The Silk Road stretched from China through India, Asia Minor, up through Mesopotamia, Egypt, Northern Africa, Greece, Rome, and Britain. Since the closing of these routes in 1453, however, we have largely been closed off from anything that could match this level of cultural exchange. In the early 1400s, Zheng He, who was an admiral of the Chinese Navy, led the largest ships and fleet in the world on seven voyages of exploration to the lands around the Indian Ocean, demonstrating Chinese excellence in shipbuilding and navigation. In Zheng He's seven journeys, the Chinese fleet traveled over four times the circumference of the earth within 28 days. Such an achievement is equivalent to going around the world every seven years, four times in a row. That would be a major accomplishment even for today's standards. Zheng He's journeys are not only historically interesting because of the knowledge that was required to build such large ships and to last these long voyages and the ability to navigate Gate through unmapped terrain, but it was remarkable in the sense that there was never an intention to colonize these regions. Instead, the focus was on trading gifts and knowledge. Another more recent example of China's good faith towards Africa is the Tazara rail line. The governments of Tanzania, Zambia, and China built the railway to eliminate landlocked Zambia's economic dependence on Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and South Africa, both of which were ruled by white minority governments. The railway provided the only route for bulk trade from Zambia's copper belt to reach the sea without having to transit white-ruled territories. The spirit of pan-African socialism among the leaders of Tanzania and Zambia and the symbolism of China's support for newly independ independent African countries gave rise to Tazara's designation as the Great Uhuru Railway, Uhuru being the Swahili word for freedom. The project was built from 1970 to 75 during Mao's reign as a turnkey project. At the time of its completion, two years ahead of schedule, the Tazara was the single longest railway in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. Tazara was the lar largest single foreign aid project undertaken by any country at the time, initial construction cost of 500 million US, which would be about 3 billion US today. In order to keep the railway running, China decided to waive 50% of its loan-free construction debt in 2011. The Chinese also very much understand the importance of classical culture, especially that of classical music, and the necessity for cultural exchange in order to ensure long-term peace. Western classical music by the 19th century quickly gained popularity and prestige as a symbol of the Western culture of scientific progress and modernization. The rigors of classical training fit the Confucian value of self-cultivation through self-discipline. Confucius believed that the study of music was an indispensable way to train the mind and consider it more important than mathematics and writing. The great sage said that one is roused by songs, poetry, and perfected by music. Confucianism and classical music both came under severe attack during Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution, 
which went from 1966 to 76. The communist government portrayed European music as a bourgeois invention used for counter-revolutionary ends. However, by the 1980s, thanks to the leadership of President Deng Xiaoping, China began, began to re-embrace Confucianism, and it was then that classical music was also allowed to return. By the early 1990s, the Chinese government was deliberately encouraging the study of music through its education policy, recognizing its importance in developing young minds. Since the removal of the ban on classical music, classical music has quickly grown in China, such that many top Western music schools are now being filled with the majority of Chinese student musicians, and Western music professors cannot help but be amazed at the level of passion and discipline the Chinese have towards classical music. Li Dailun is the father of classical music in China. In 1946, he took an assortment of donated musical instruments to the city of Yan'an and became the founder, instructor, and conductor of China's first professional symphony orchestra. In 1953, he went to Moscow to further his studies under the celebrated conductor Nikolai Anasov. He returned to China in 1957 after graduating from the Moscow Conservatory and was the conductor of the China Central Philharmonic Orchestra. What is interesting about Li Dailun, besides the fact that he started the first orchestra in China, is that he managed to survive the Cultural Revolution, for one, Many artists were imprisoned, tortured, and executed during this time. But what is more important is that towards the end of the Cultural Revolution, despite the very strict ban on classical music, Maestro Li bravely presented Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in a concert commemorating the 150th anniversary of Beethoven's death. The event was so powerful that it broke the ban on public performances of Western music and drew worldwide attention, signaled the reemergence of classical music in China. To quote uh, Maestro Li, people need this product of the West to liberate their cultural thinking from 2,000 years of feudalism. I want us to take a moment and listen to a few minutes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And I want us to imagine ourselves having lived through the oppression and violence during the Cultural Revolution where both scientists and artists were censored, imprisoned, tortured, and even killed. Beauty and art was banned and considered decadent, and therefore, in a very real way, beauty had been banned within the thoughts and dreams of the individual. Let us imagine living through something like this and being present at this concert of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which had such an effect that it lifted the ban on classical music. Imagine what hearing this piece of music after 10 years of being forbidden it must have felt like in that audience of thousands of people, would it not be likened to the feeling of finally being free? Oh, sorry, I didn't know I was gonna. <laughs>
it's much longer than that, but we don't have the time to listen to all of it. But who says that classical music can't be political, can't be an efficient intervention into politics when it's hit a wall in terms of solutions? I want to include a quote that's uh, very recent from uh, Ambassador Liu Jiyi. The Belt and Road Initiative is an international public good that benefits all parties. The initiative widens and deepens partnerships in multidimensional and multi-layered networking. The initiative does not replace existing regional platforms but seeks to achieve synergy among various strategies and take common development further through closer international cooperation. To use a musical metaphor, it is not China's solo, but a symphony performed by all of the countries. In other words, what he's saying is that this isn't China trying to enforce itself and its way on other countries, but is saying that we all need to work together to uplift the world. Doesn't sound very controversial to me. Let us quickly revisit this glorious picture of the Kinshasa Orchestra. I hope this picture signifies something deeper than at the beginning of this class. For me, it juxtaposes the past with the future in a very striking way. The Kinshasa Orchestra is obviously making a statement here. They refuse to be defined by their post-colonial past any longer, and their vision now lies in the realized potential of their future. In other words, they are free. Classical music is political because it is about the emancipation of the individual, as the Chinese clearly understand today. The New Silk Road is not about providing free aid to Africans, but about freeing them from their economic shackles so that they can fulfill the potential they were destined to fulfill. Let us make that a reality. Thank you.